All right, good morning, everybody. We are live on Facebook, we're live on Instagram this morning. Uh, this is the Ask a Painter live show, and before we dive into it, uh, Saturday edition, I am going to check my feed just to make sure that everything is up and running that we got. Ooh, let's go. Let's get the old mic going here. All right. To make sure we got audio, video, everything rolling here. All right, give me just a second, making sure everything works before I plow ahead for an hour. All right, let me check right here. All right, there's that nasally drone. Okay, we are good to go. So, <coughs> Good morning, everybody. It's a beautiful Saturday in here in Minnesota. Crisp and cool outside. Uh, this is a open show, but I'm going to make a big ask of everybody today. I am prepping for a monstrous, what do you charge for X show? It's my estimating treatise. I have a master's class. That's about a four hour thing that I travel around the US and talk with contractors about how we how we sort of come up with price, how we estimate, because this is that big squishy thing where you don't necessarily know if you've done it right and you may never know if you do it right. So the one big ask I'm gonna make of you guys today, if I was to devote another show all to that question, what do you charge for X? Is my pricing right? What could I do to help you guys? I have monstrous amounts of data. I have monstrous amounts of experience. I have a four hour master's class that could do that. But in, in what little chunks, what little tips, what mysteries can I help you solve with estimating, with pricing, and all that other stuff? Uh, that's something that, um, God, of all the questions I get, I get, how do you schedule? Uh, what do you charge for X, this and that? And it's a sort of an unsatisfying question because there's many ways to approach it. I'm going to share some stuff today as we get to that. But uh, yeah, all right. We've got people rolling in here. Uh, let's see. Aaron, good morning. Uh, Jerry, how's it going? Uh, good friend, Brian Santos, friend of the show, friend of the industry, friend of mine. Good to see you, sir. Uh, James, absolutely. James, I'd love to know uh, what, what, uh, what would be the most helpful thing that would demystify estimating, stuff like that. Michael Crane, good friend, Michael Crane. Um, modifiers, uh, let me know what you mean by modifiers. Uh, I'd be happy to help. And then Ryan. Okay, everybody. So again, this is an open topic, open, uh, open suggestions for anything you guys want to talk about. I am going to get into, uh, let me get my stuff back up here. Do, 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 do. There we go. So uh, thank you, everybody, uh, for, uh, for watching. This is the Ask a Painter Live show. I'm Nick Slavic. I'm the host of Ask a Painter Live. I'm also the proprietor of the Nick Slavic Painting and Restoration Company. This is a show where I use my two decades of experience as a craftsman and a business owner to, to help other people work through the things that we all work through usually alone. So we're going live on Instagram as well. I'll take any topic suggestions, any, uh, any questions you guys have. Uh, you can suggest anything you wanna talk about. Uh, also, I'm gonna make an ask in this show. What can I do to help with the whole estimating thing? Uh, it's something that after, you know, this is now my 29th year of being involved in this industry and we have it dialed in very, very close. The only thing that is out of our control is the market, what the market will allow us to charge for certain things. So we can have all our internal processes, right? We can buy all the cost and estimating guides, by the way the PCA, the Painting Contractors Association, huge underwriter of this show. It's something I don't talk about very often. I actually have these things right here. Listen, you guys, what do you charge for X? They have them. These things are all out there. This is a great baseline for what you do. Now, there is no magic solve all your problems sort of cheat sheet you can do. But that is a monstrously helpful piece of data that you can use. The Painting Contractors Association is here for that reason. There are going to be huge, huge changes, huge, huge things coming down the road with the PCA. There's going to be a change of command happening very shortly here. And then with that comes new initiatives. And uh, it's going to be an amazing, amazing process. Uh, one of the best things that the PCA does is in-person events, including the expo where there's a thousand people there, the give or take, obviously curtailed this last year, but 
We're finding new ways to connect. There's the paint ed group online. There's all sorts of other groups. And uh, the second they loosen restrictions and everybody is safe and feels safe, we're going back to that stuff. So, okay. Oh, we got fresh paint up in, uh, excuse me, Instagram here. How should we apply polyurethane to 12 walnut doors? Spray, if so, how would you approach that? So yes, uh, if you've seen uh, any images of my shop, uh, you can, the, the two most popular ways, the ultra quick, super sneaky production method is to zigzag the doors, stand them straight up and down, screw or nail boards into the top of them so they all stand up straight and make a clean work environment with floor protection and everything and then spray. Uh, what we like to do in my shop is to what we call peg them. So we take floating shelf brackets, put them in the tops and the bottoms of the doors so we can lay them between sawhorses, the pegs rack on the doors, uh, and then we spray them that way. Uh, soon, I will be getting the full fast rack set up for this sort of thing. If you've ever seen like Zach Kenny's shop, he's got the rolling carts with the things that go on the doors. Once our shop is fully operational, we have about another month or two we are going to get some of those and we're going to fully outfit the shop with those. So it's kind of like crawl, walk, run, one of those things where super sneaky job site, zigzag them. The next step, get some brackets. You can kind of make do with that way. The Cadillac method is the fast rack system. And uh, if you guys need more information about that, let me know. Uh, if you've never met Michael Halverson, the dude who owns fast rack uh, equipment, uh, he's such a good guy. I actually drove out to his shop to see his facility and stuff to pick up my order of stuff because he's such a good guy. And uh, he's such an interesting uh, sort of story as a painting contractor turned entrepreneur. And I would urge you, if nothing else, talk to the dude. Uh, super responsive. Awesome guy. Ah, Prestige Painting. Uh, another one from Instagram. Uh, Airless Spraying. What undercoater would you use for oak cabinets in order to top coat with a lacquer? Lots of stuff going on there. Okay, so if you're gonna use lacquer, I would use a lacquer undercoater. Now, I will say this, uh, this is not a judgment call. I am not a fan of lacquer, uh, only because it does not hold up to water very well. Now, there are good lacquers, and I've seen good people do good things with lacquer, but if I had a choice, I would always go oil primer and then a hybrid top coat or a water-based top coat. Certainly, you can use oil top coat, but those things probably won't be around forever. So. Prestige painting, Instagram, I would say, read your technical data sheets. In the technical data sheet of your lacquer top coat, it will tell you what undercoater to use. Uh, you'll just have to, usually it gives you a couple options. There's a water-based and maybe a solvent-based one. Solvent will probably block the stains and sand a little easier. Water-based, probably dry a little quicker. And then, uh, well, maybe not. Uh, it'll be easier on the environment, uh, easier on the homeowner as well if you're doing it in-house. So. All right, let's go through some of the. Do, 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 do. Uh, let's see. All right, the buyer's watching. Anthony Cade, good morning. Anthony Cade, he sent me a picture of a, a kitchen he just toned. That's amazing, man. Uh, that's, that's truly a mark of a craftsman. Like when you can tone a set of cabinets and get them even and get a good finish and have it durable, that's amazing. So if you, if you haven't seen Anthony's kitchen, uh, check that out. Anthony's a guy that I've actually sat down and had barbecue with multiple times uh, in Missouri. Awesome dude. All right. Alex Harrison, thanks for the ScuffX recommendation. Yes, I will agree. So <clears throat> you guys know that I have friends in the industry all over, Sherwin-Williams, Benjamin Moore, Hirschfields, all sorts of stuff, Zinsser, whatever else. I just look for what's good. And uh, uh, people try to get me to use all sorts of stuff all the time. All I can do is go by the data and the feelings. Uh, I can test stuff in my shop. And then I can use my 30 years of experience doing this and overlay data plus feelings to find good stuff. So that's basically what you're doing. If you have not used ScuffX yet, uh, do yourself a favor. Uh, it's not the end all and be all, nothing is, but it's an awesome tool at our disposal. Uh, let's see, Anthony Brown, good morning. Maybe talk about uh, the art of selling the customer on different paints. The good, the bad, <laughs> a lot. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay, interesting. I have lots of thoughts about this, Anthony. I do eight or 900 estimates a year. Honestly, people don't care about paint. Um, I did, uh, now that I have an estimator, I'm doing less estimates every week. I still probably did about mm, 15 estimates last week. And honestly, not one person asked what kind of paint I use. Uh, the only time that people ask what paint I use is wall paint because they don't want builders flat. They're not asking for a specific brand or anything. What they, what they want, what they don't want is builders flat. So when they ask, hey, does this paint, are you gonna use a satin or are you gonna use uh, 
semi-gloss or whatever else. They don't care the brand. They don't care that. That's my data point. There are markets where people are super heavy into that. You must use this. You must use this. But honestly, Anthony, uh, I have a selling rule in my company that estimator Andy and I, world-class estimator Andy Hall, we have a thing that we remind ourselves that don't give them any information that they're not looking for. If they're not into what type of enamel, you know, the difference between lacquer and hybrid and water-based and oil-based stuff, don't go into that. They don't care. So uh, I learned that from a, a, uh, an insanely good person who runs a monstrous sales team in the trades. And just keep it simple. They'll let you know what they're in for. So Anthony, I, I like the question. Uh, it's not something I run into often. Um, the only time that I bring up different paints is when somebody's getting multiple estimates and they've got them before me and they start talking about, well, yeah, well, this person uses this. And I'll say, well, you know, that's a thing. I will never talk bad about another contractor, but I will tell you why I use the thing I use, especially when we get into like lacquer and stuff like that. So uh, Michael Crane, basic estimating can be broken down into square foot for regular painting. Modifiers are holes, irregularities. <laughs> Absolutely. Yep. I agree there. So what I do is I, uh, I love, uh, the kitchen cabinet painters mastermind group, uh, which, which Michael is a part of there. They have, uh, an insanely rigorous, uh, process estimating price guide, things like that. I love that stuff. Uh, there are many ways to estimate, uh, in this stuff. For me, we keep it as simple as possible because I'm a firm believer and this, this works really well for my people because it's through my prism. I, I recruit people who are on board with my sort of way of thinking, our core values and stuff. Simplicity is, is great because what I like to do is I believe that most humans, I would rather have 90% compliance with a super simple system than 50% compliance with an insanely difficult, technically uh, uh, hard to understand system like that. I would rather have a few things happen right all the time than have so many things floating around that some get missed or some get weird. So what I've done, uh, Michael, is honestly, we charge the same amount for every kitchen uh, set of kitchen cabinets we do. If we see something so far outlierish, we will actually add a little something to it as a line item on an estimate. But honestly, we don't run into that many cabinets that are super greasy. And even if we do, it's only an extra hour or two in our shop of scrubbing cabinet doors. So we we don't focus too heavily on that. Now, what we do do, uh, Michael, is you know now that we have an on-staff carpenter, it's all those things about hinges, drawer boxes, drawer slides, and poles and all that stuff. Those are the things that we look into because we can completely re-outfit a kitchen. Uh, I like the modifiers, though. Alfonso, how's it going, man? Uh, we connected last week too. Uh, great to talk to you. Uh, let's see. We'll go through a couple of Facebook questions here. Kareem, Nick, do you have contact for Nick Slavic Twins in Espanol? We recently started a private group with the help with Corey. Oh, nice. Someone like you involved in Spanish. Ooh, boy. Uh, Kareem, email me, nick at nickslavic.com. Uh, very interesting. Uh, I actually had a couple bilingual events scheduled this last year and they were canceled because of COVID. So that's one of the things I was looking forward to the most is traveling the country and taking some of my uh, Spanish speaking counterparts with me, the, the, uh, the Spanish Nick Slavics of the painting industry and doing a bilingual event. So Kareem, email me and uh, I can connect you. All right, Anthony, how do you handle estimating when you're doing something you have never done before? Yes, I love this. This is a question. The job I just sent you. We did okay, but definitely underestimated. Yes, know this. You will always underestimate that. Uh, something that estimator Andy and I do is a thought experiment called bedroom equivalence or uh, human day equivalence, where when we're trying to figure out an odd carpentry job or we're trying to figure out a weird sort of like, you know, a painting job we haven't done before. Let's say it's a monstrous commercial job and it's repaint and it's cleaning and it's this and it's unique. This is the thing where I'm not a fan of square footage and linear footage and things like that because... It's a good baseline. We do collect it, but don't ever think that it's the perfect solution for all this stuff. Think about when we're doing a, a weird house. Let's say it's an 8,000 square foot home, monstrous, you know, 16 foot ceilings. It's not the norm. How do you even do it? We talk about bedroom equivalents. We know that a 13 by 13 bedroom has so much wall space and it takes so much time for us to paint. We just think, how many bedrooms is this? You know, uh, we, we want our people to paint a, four, a 14 by 14 bedroom in four hours. It's going to take a gallon of paint, four hours, and we charge this for it. How many bedroom equivalents is it? 
uh, now that we have some baselines of carpentry and drywall, uh, what we do is human day equivalents. We always break it down to, well, what could we do, Andy, in a day? Like if, if you and I got dropped on this job, how many windows could we plastic off in this house? And how many holes could we patch? And how much could we prep? And we start thinking about human day equivalents. And then because we, we use job costing and industry benchmarks, we would like to charge between or produce between 55 and $65 an hour. We work 10 hour days for 10 hour days. So basically we need to, uh, we need to figure out a way to generate somewhere between 550 and 650 of revenue per day per person. So when you think, well, listen, uh, estimator Andy, if he was dropped on this job, it'd probably be a three day project for him. Well, good. Then you're going to need about $1,950 worth of revenue for that project, give or take. And then you do what we love to do is the sniff test, which is you create the estimate, you do that. And you're like, does it pass? Does it feel good? Does it, does, are we uh, creating value for the client? Things like that. So that's what I, I love that stuff. Uh, there's nothing I like better than a good, uh, something I've never, uh, estimated before. Oh, Phil Klein. Love Phil Klein. Uh, Michael Crane. Uh, Phil Klein was drinking some old fashions last night. Me attempted me to make my own. Uh, every one of our jobs is a combination of square foot per item price and hourly. Yes, per item price is another thing. So again, guys, any topic, any suggestion, I am, pre I am prepping for the monstrous how to estimate this. What do you charge for X show coming up? And if there's anything I can do, if there's anything I can do to help that, what's the one thing I can help you get perspective or solve? Uh, let's see, Brian Santos. What are a couple tips to increase painters effectiveness and productivity? So uh, what you want to see increased or decreased, you must measure and you must hold people accountable to. You know this, I know you're just asking the question, but if you want to get production up, you need to track production, you need to have a goal, and then you need to check up on people. Um, as we think about like Apprenticeship 2.0, which starts in another week uh, with, with a whole bunch of uh, young painters, um, we have to, even in training, <coughs> there's this principle called Doragi. And it's basically like you show them something, they do a little bit, you re-show them again, you give them a goal, you check on it, you inspect it, and then you re-sort of do that process all the time. But just showing somebody and sending them out there and delegating the work to them doesn't work. So what we do is we track everybody's production numbers and we give them goals. We just tell them. Uh, one of the best things we can do, uh, Brian and the rest of the industry, is when you bring painters in here, you say, okay, we have a bedroom to paint. This is how many hours it should take. And we know how many hours it should take because we take the $400 that we charge for that bedroom. We minus out about 15% for materials as an estimate. And that leaves us with... X amount of dollars. We divide that by 55 or 60, depending on what you want, hourly rate. And then that gives us how many hours that bedroom should take. Letting a young person know, or somebody who has not done this before, how many hours something should take, and then showing them what has to happen each one of those hours is the biggest thing we can do to snap it into focus. Imagine if, if I got thrust into an iron worker uh, position somewhere, and I'd never done it before, and somebody was just screaming at me, do it better, do it faster. I would say, listen, man, I've never done this before. How am I supposed to possibly understand what this is? Is this a year long project? Is this supposed to be done in two hours? Like you need to help me and then you need to coach me through it. And then you need to hold me accountable to those things. So, all right, boy, the questions are coming in. I love this guys. This Saturday morning thing is, uh, is awesome. Uh, Bradford. Uh, I own a design build remodeling company in New Hampshire. Love listening. Great insight for all the trades. Uh, thank you so much, man. And Bradford, I would love to know too, uh, you know, as painters complain about things that we haven't estimated before. I mean, every one of your jobs must be full of that. So I would love to know, Bradford, when you approach a job and somebody wants something that you haven't done before, what's your first gut instinct or how do you begin to start focusing that? So, oh man, Trevor Gibbs, childhood friend, current friend, uh, Watching from Little Germany, my second hometown, New Ulm. Uh, uh, Trevor's an awesome dude. Uh, longtime army soldier and dentist now. Uh, proud to call him a friend and uh, practicing down in New Ulm now. Love that stuff. Uh, James Gilbert, Scuff X Satin. Absolutely. Switch from Regal Classic Semi to Scuff X Satin. Listen, man. It, again, I know, especially when we get into these uh, kitchen cabinet groups, there are things that fit people's businesses better. There are things that are harder. There are things that dry faster. There are things that whatever. Uh, I've never found a combination of super sophisticated look of actual enamel, super fast, sans easy, uh, doesn't block, doesn't stick to anything, 
and just is so easy to use that you can't, I mean, we have people that have only been in the trades for a week or two spraying this stuff and they can't make it fail. My entire house is that stuff. And honestly, it's just one of those, like, it's just a good paint. People think that when you recommend something, you're saying, stop doing whatever else you're doing and you must do this. It's like, no, this is a weapon that we have at our disposal to use in, in what we do. It's awesome. Uh, Fatty, thank you so much. Uh, good morning. Very interesting. Thank you, sir. Uh, Sheikh Salim, good morning. Brian, what are your results and opinions about the primer you tested the other day? Oh, yeah. So we were just testing um, a straightforward utility Swiss Army knife water-based primer just for sort of like priming walls and stuff like that. I was curious about uh, how thick you could put it on, how fast you could put it on, what tip, what pump. Uh, sort of like, you know, the scenario would be, Brian, you go into a vacant house. We're going to be doing popcorn stripping. They want all the walls redone. And the most typical kind of paint project we do now is there's dark tan, dark gray, dark red walls, and they want to go white or off white. What's the quickest, most valuable way to the client that we, effective way that we can change that whole house into that? Because normally we would, we would brush and roll a coat of primer on, then we would brush and roll two coats of top coat on. And this way, what we do is I'm just seeing how fast we can speed this up, how we can add value, how we can turn these houses over quicker than that. So, uh, da, 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 da. so yes, uh, great, great product. Um, it, it performs a, a lot like other stuff and, uh, just sort of, I'm just getting a data point. Uh, we also were in the shop doing some fine paints of Europe stuff. So that's, uh, that's always fun to do to flex that craftsman muscle. It's a nice challenge every once in a while. Bradford, uh, how do you use your job costing to improve your estimating pricing? How do you keep a spreadsheet to adjust your cost based on the real data? Yes, this is what I love. So <clears throat> the biggest tip I can give people doesn't go over very well, which is what do you charge for X? Well, I don't know. Do some job cost it. That'll tell you if your pricing's on. So let's say, you know, if the industry benchmark is uh, we, we change our pricing based on production in the field. Because right now, let's be very honest, I've been doing this for 29 years. I can paint a bedroom a hell of a lot faster than somebody who's been doing this for six months. So the problem is, do you base pricing on my production rates or do you price it on somebody who's only been here for two weeks? Both are wrong because we have people all over in the middle. We have master crafts people in the company who are in between, uh, some, some like me, some like apprentices, this like that. So what I do is basically, this is unsatisfying, but paint three bedrooms, track how much paint, how many hours, and then you charge for those and then basically do the job costing and it'll tell you how much revenue per hour you generated. If you've hit 55, 60, 65, then you know that price was okay, but it doesn't tell you it's a perfect price. You might've been able to charge more. You might've had to charge a little less, but if you're producing $25 of revenue an hour, you know you either need to speed your painting up or change your price. If you know your coding system is down pat, if you know you're working as hard as you can, then you basically need to change your price. Uh, if you feel that you made a bunch of mistakes, uh, things didn't go well, you had to repatch, you had to put another coat on, then don't change your price. You need a good baseline. The, all this is based in, you know what you're doing, you have a proven product. If you don't know what primer to use on cabinets, pricing isn't your problem, it's your process. If you don't if you don't have success with walls, if you had to do four or five coats on a wall, uh, don't change your price to do that. You need to be a better painter first before you start charging these clients more for that stuff. So that's basically how we do it. We're, we, we change our pricing in response to job costing. Uh, when we started drywall this last year, I was basically like, listen, let's, let's, we can survey the industry. I can talk to some experts across the country and I can get some basic pricing about drywall stuff. And then at that point, you know, most people get frozen in this sort of like, well, how do we know if it's right? It's like, you don't until you try it. So do some estimates, get it out there, job cost them, and that'll tell you what it is. And then you always have to weigh that thing. Did my people perform correctly? Was the pricing right? Which one affected it more like that? And that's how you go forward. That's the most effective way. But the problem is that takes effort and it's not an instant fix. So Bradford, sometimes people don't like to hear that, but it is the right way. So uh, Gerardo, how's it going, man? Good friend, Gerardo. Chaz, top of the morning to you as well. Marty, good morning. Mike Wojohn, fellow Minnesota painter. Uh, Alfonso, uh, also Minnesota painters. If you guys are out there, we have a group called the Gathering of Minnesota Painters. We even let some... Uh, 
we even let some south of the border Iowans in and Wisconsinites in, uh, you know, against our against our better judgment. But uh, if you're a painter and you're from Minnesota, check out the Gathering of Minnesota Painters. Uh, it's an awesome Facebook group. Typically, we get together four times a year. Again, uh, curtailed due to COVID, but we will resume that very shortly. Ah, uh, Alfonso, do you ever use a laser distance meter when estimating? Yes, but only for drywall and ceilings. Uh, for rooms, uh, so there's, there's um, just like Phil Klein was saying before, uh, there is market price. So basically there is a price that the market will bear. And as contractors, we're all trying to say, we wanna charge the most we can possibly charge for these while still adding value to our clients and keep our businesses running. There is unit pricing. Uh, and then there is sort of production rate pricing, which is, you know, how many square feet, how many linear feet, this and that. I use a combination of all that stuff. When we do, when we just do a wall project, we have a bedroom equivalent. It's a, a powder room is this much money. A bathroom is this much money. A bedroom is this much money. A master bedroom is this much money. A stairwell, there's three different kinds of stairwells. Uh, a foyer stairwell combination. There's three different kinds of those. Stairs down, there's only two or three different kinds of those too. And they're all basically bedroom equivalents like that. So we actually have, we've done so much repetitions with wall painting. We just have unit prices for that stuff. Now, when we go into whole house trim things, I mean, these are $30,000 estimates sometimes. I actually have a, a, a two tab spreadsheet. One is my estimate form and one is a worksheet that feeds into the estimate, uh, uh, my G sheets. And it lists every room. And then basically it lists all the prices for windows, for doors, for baseboard, for closets, uh, ceilings, cabinets, and then miscellaneous stuff. And it's basically a, 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 a worksheet. You can say, okay, in this bathroom, uh, the walls are going to be X because it's a unit price. Do we have a closet? A closet wall is this. Closet baseboard is always this price uh, for a standard closet. And then we basically say for, for baseboard, it's a unit price. There's only so much baseboard in a room. It doesn't really vary. It's only really X, X, or 3X. Um, for cabinet doors, we count up the doors and drawers. For doors, we count the doors. For windows, we count the windows. And for each type of window, there's a unit price. And I timed myself out this week. I did a whole house, three level, uh, trim, wall, cabinet, uh, closet estimate. And it took me about 14 minutes in my van. Once I, you know, I have my tablet and I'm writing with my digital stylus. I'm going room by room, snapping pictures, doing that. And then it took me about 17 minutes in the van to actually type this in. And it all feeds into the estimate form in a beautiful thing. Because the client doesn't need to know how many windows and doors they have. They just want to see that, that nice sort of thing. So... That's the sort of thing that we do there. That is a unit pricing uh, where we have it down to a science where we just charge for X and, and we do that. So, but yes, when I do drywall estimates, I walk into a room, just go this way, this way, length, time, width, once in a while a ceiling. But uh, Eric Sowers, good morning. Uh, Gerardo, what's your process to finish skim coated walls? Uh, interesting. So I'm assuming the scenario Gerardo is something had to happen to the walls. Let's say it's a wallpaper job and there's just divots and things there from a client taking wallpaper off. Uh, walls have been skim coated. I would go PVA primer over the top of that. Uh, anytime we have new drywall, new mud, I love PVA, polyvinyl acrylic, because it's a thin primer, it soaks in. And the second thing that almost nobody talks about is it sands really easy. So you can take a pole sander and hit that stuff and you can make it feel like polished marble on there. Uh, Angie Moore, good morning. Uh, and then I would basically, uh, you know, clean up the dust and paint it, uh, Gerardo. I'm going to put a pin in Angie Moore's uh, thing there. Uh, John Busick sniff test. John Busick, friend from California. Awesome, man. Uh, let's go through Instagram and see if I didn't miss. I think I've been ne neglecting. Uh, Sam from Instagram. Business is growing faster and we basically cannot afford that growth. What do you have to suggest for that? This is what I did. So... Uh, talk to your local bank, uh, find somebody that you can work with that you have a great working relationship with and open up a business line of credit. And uh, you have to put up some assets for it. So I put up a bunch of a uh, bunch of my vans against it. And basically you have at your disposal uh, a basic loan or line of credit 
you know, uh, typically, you know, a million dollar business uh, with 10 painters, you should probably have $100,000, $200,000 line of credit. And that money is basically yours to use at any time. There's a there's an interest rate attached to it, usually three to 5%. It's in your bank and uh, you can actually instantly transfer that. You don't have to apply for a loan. You don't have to wait for a period. It's there. You can electronic transfer it into your thing and you can pay it off as you want. And there's just a fixed rate. And I will say that over the last three years of growing this business, um, Obviously cash is great, but it's not always there. Uh, a lot of times uh, just helping to meet payroll in some of the months where you take on a lot of trainees, it's there, It's you, you could bump into that cash and then you can just pay it back eventually like that. And it's a, it's a great thing. So I will say absolutely uh, go get a line of credit, but then uh, be very, uh, be very steadfast with it and don't go crazy with it. You know, don't go, don't go buying eight vehicles and stuff like that for it. So all right, uh, JG Woodworks, how do you charge the same for every kitchen? Oh, my apologies, that is a, I misspoke. We charge the same rate per door and drawer, give or take. So um, that's way oversimplifying. Uh, the going rate in the industry when we survey is plus or minus $100 per door and drawer. So the typical kitchen, average kitchen has 37 doors and drawers in my market. So basically, you know, you go 100, 110, 90, whatever you feel is right. Uh, for smaller companies that don't need a lot of work, you can go 150 bucks a cabinet. But you'd basically be charging, you know, if you're at 100, 3,700 bucks. If it's 45 doors and drawers, 4,500, things like that. So that's a good, uh, that's a good, uh, good thing to clarify. Uh, Nick, your knowledge is saving my business. Oh, Sam, thanks a lot, man. That's awesome. <laughs> Ah, uh, Rue, that's the truth under uh, estimating something that's never done. I absolutely agree. So even if you have your per unit pricing, your production rates and everything, people have this question about estimating all the time because it's never solved. The market changes. If you look back three years ago, we weren't char charging the same rate, but how do you know when it's time to change? I will say one of the biggest things, uh, one of the biggest things that uh, I use to gauge whether we're doing right with pricing or not. And this is this is actually probably one of the next greatest things I could tell somebody about this, which is track your SR, your success ratio. I've found very smart people have coached me on this, saying that if you close about 50% of your estimates, your pricing is probably right. 50% of your estimates for a company bigger than one person will probably allow you to operate. Now, the difference is like, the reason I don't take my rate sheets and just hand them over to people is because we have 20 to 25 people and we're a growing company and most of our people are apprentices or in their apprenticeship. That pricing for that business model will not be the same for the solopreneur. I would hand over a completely different rate sheet for them. Um, so tracking your success ratio. Basically, you know your pricing is right if I feel like if you have somewhere between a two and four week lead time, for your business, whether you're one person or 50, and you close about half of your estimates, that's one data point saying that your pricing is probably right. If you're closing 80% of your estimates, your pricing is too low. If you're closing 10 to 30% of your estimates, either you're charging too much or your pricing might be right on. If you're a solopreneur and, and you have great word of mouth and everybody calls you and you really don't need that, you only need a job a week, you can close 10 to 30% of your work and it'll still be fine. So. All right, let's go. I'll catch up on IG here. Ah, Grit City Painters, any update on your 2021 Masterclass Tour? Yes. So I am finding a way to make a public calendar where people can reference it. Within two weeks, I will have that up. Uh, we're starting to talk. There's about maybe three to four ones that we're dancing around right now. And then I'm gonna start filling in with my own stuff. So yes, there is something coming soon. Uh, lots of fun stuff down the pike here. Uh, John Busek sniff test. I love the sniff test and the sniff test is a valuable thing uh, uh, that a lot of us industry veterans do where some things just smell right and we can use our sort of like intuition our spidey sense sometimes and be like, it just doesn't feel right. It feels like this would be right. And it's based on something you can't really put your finger on. It's more like 30 years of experience in the trade. So <clears throat> ah, here we go, John. This is the stuff I love. John Busick, who's in charge of cleaning sprayer rigs in your company? We are forced to clean brushes, buckets, and rigs off site in, in, uh, in shop, California. Makes accountability tough. Yes. So up until about six months ago, everybody had to clean their own sprayers. And you can imagine how that goes. We had piles of inoperable, unclean sprayers. Uh, right now, 
uh, we have everything cleaned in our shop by our shop manager. And as of now, we have nothing dirty in the shop. We've, we have at least 15 operable sprayers right now. He has gone through these things, taking apart the electronic portions of it. He's online. He's looking up uh, the guides and stuff. It's so easy here. Um, because we can sort of just do it all in our shop, our people, it's, it's an awesome system. And this is something that, uh, again, tragedy of the commons. If you guys have never heard of this economic principle, think about a public restroom. A public restroom is one of the nastiest places on the planet. Why? Because nobody owns it and nobody's really held accountable for it. If somebody owned that bathroom and paid for it, or somebody were to check up on that person and say, you are going to get paid based on the cleanliness and usability of this bathroom, magically you would get a good result. So my shop for a decade has been a tragedy of the commons. People do great things, it's fine. But since nobody really owns it, it's not a thing, You know, things aren't as perfect as they could be. Now we have a shop manager and every Monday morning I go down to that shop and I work on his checklist where we actually check all the sprayers and things like that. It's beautiful. Everything is working good. Another thing, John, I will tell you this, a sneaky thing that I learned from uh, uh, buddy Zach Kenny out in Boston is uh, Safety Clean has parts cleaners uh, with earth-friendly, non-evaporative, non-caustic solvents that you can wash everything in. And it's a closed loop system where you get the barrel underneath, the parts cleaner on top. And my people have been doing that uh, in order to save on the environment. Uh, you know, instead of uh, people dumping slop paint down drains and stuff, we use one of those safety clean things. And it's a, uh, it's a pretty awesome thing. Also, John, what we've been doing too is uh, there's stuff I get from Sherwin. I forget the exact name of it, but it's basically a, uh, a spill a spill fixing sort of powder. It's sort of like that stuff they used to janitors through on vomit uh, when we were going to school, but it's basically a paint coagulant that'll actually make paint non-toxic. Uh, it'll soak up everything and you can actually throw it away in the trash. So I get it from Sherwin Williams. It comes in a, in a big box in a bag and you basically just mix it up with paint. It's a coagulant and it actually makes it safe for disposal uh, in, in trash. So I would look into that. Ah, uh, Angie Moore, what about Eastern Iowans? Well, listen, I don't know. That might be a bridge too far for the gathering of Minnesota painters. So <laughs> no, listen, if you're, if you guys are close and, and you share our core values and, and, uh, and that we're all, we're all for it. So Angie, I need that spreadsheet. Where can I buy it? Again, it will not solve your problems. Uh, I will hand over my entire Google drive. It's got a terabyte of information estimate. I mean, there might be there might be 7,000 estimates and projects that I've done on there. Uh, it will not help you. You need, you need data plus feelings. That would give you the data, but you will not have the feelings. If you just operated my estimating system in your company, you may either sell every job and be burdened with work that's not profitable or never sell a job. So uh, uh, let's see, Gerardo, uh, I went PVA and got bubbles in the finish. So here's the deal. Uh, if you're using hot mud, anything that's not just regular like plus three or general purpose. I see this happen a lot. Um, we tend to stay away from this sort of thing only because there's some witchcraft that goes on with some of these hot muds uh, after a while with bubbles. Uh, honestly, I've never ran into bubbles in cabinet doors and walls and other stuff if we stay away from hot mud, if we stay away from crazy chemistry that we don't understand. Uh, if you go oil primer and scuff X on cabinets, you can't make it fisheye. We have no examples of it fisheyeing, no examples of it uh, chipping, peeling, bleeding, any of that stuff. So uh, go simple. Uh, I would I would much rather skim a house with either general purpose or plus three and not have to run into that stuff. But I'd be curious to know uh, know how it went. So Brian Chemnitz, good morning. Uh, Thomas Drake, thanks a lot, man. I really appreciate it. You rock too. Uh, Paul, uh, where do you put ads out to find good human beings and but to potentially hire. So that is step number six in a 30 step process of bringing people in. Number one, um, uh, Paul, you need to have a professionalized company. You need to have the what it takes to be able to make people happy and to bring good people in. So job descriptions, pay scale, employee handbook. Uh, you need to have some standards in which to judge them by. You need to have deliverables. Uh, you got to have all these things in your company before you bring these people in. Because if we're not professionalized enough, we're going to bring somebody in and they're going to be like, I don't see a future here. And we can say, oh, you have a great future here. And they'll say, I can't point to anything that you've shown me that says there's any future here besides me working for an hourly rate. So um, 
when you get to the point, step number six or seven of actually putting an ad out, you must put something out different. If you put something out that says lift 50 pounds, have your own tools, three years experience, you'll get garbage. That uh, statistically in my area, you will get garbage people uh, coming into your company. So uh, try different places. Uh, Facebook uh, is a great resource. They have the jobs category there. Try Indeed, try ZipRecruiter. Uh, Craigslist does not work in my area. Uh, that is the dregs of society here if you're looking for employees. So I know other people like in Colorado, sometimes it works great. So it's, it's culturally, it's different from place to place. So um, I would say, Paul, uh, if, you've, if you've done all that stuff, get a really interesting picture, get some really interesting wording, something that people don't use and just try it. You got to attract different people. You know, we're, we're doing the same thing over for decades and, uh, and it's not working. So, all right. Uh, Wendy, thanks for the closed caption. Absolutely. I love that feature uh, on Facebook. They automatically generate it. Uh, what's a brand of sander that your craftsman was using to sand cabinet doors with your dust collector? Yes, Brian, surf prep. Huge fan, not paid to say it. Uh, I've been a fan for a lot of years. Um, I was actually fortunate enough to, oh yeah, Surf Prep 3x4. We use medium grit with a thicker pad like that. That's our just universal system. They make stuff for everything. They're, there's all sorts of grits, all sorts of stuff. We keep it simple. We got one grit, we got one sander. Can't mess it up, young apprentice. Um, Let's see here. Do, 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 do. Yes, so I was, I was, uh, I was privileged enough to actually meet the family that owns Surf Prep, and I mean, I, obviously, I like the Sanders and I like the way they do business. But when you meet the family, it's like that's one of the most substantial groups of human beings that I've ever met in my life. They, they are good to the core. They are generous. They deeply care about our industry and our people. When, when they ask us, like when they ask you or when they talk to you, they talk about you, your family, your business, the pain points, the good points. They're not talking about grits of sandpaper most of the time. It's a wonderful thing. Uh, and those sanders, um, they are not gimmicks. Uh, they are made to be used in industrial settings by robots 24 hours a day going for years at a time. Uh, so for us, that sand a few cabinets, magic. They're just, they're wonderful, wonderful things. We have two at our downdraft sanding table. So Ah, uh, Michael Holston, Daily Dose of Nick. Thanks for all you do. Hey, man, I'm happy to do it. I, I make, I am a better person because of all the interactions I have with you guys. It keeps me honest. I learned so much from you guys. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing. So thank you. Uh, Tina, Trainer Tina. I was at my nephew's birthday party yesterday and they had received Nick Slavic ad on their door. Nice. That is good to hear. I'm glad to hear people are getting those things. Uh, for your sake and for mine, Tina, because <laughs> we want to keep this thing rolling. Ah, uh, Paul Lambor. Nick, we have the same opinion of what comes from Craigslist. Yes. Ah, uh, Brian Chemnitz, favorite drying rack system for cabinets, doors, uh, for shop use. Yes, fast rack. You will never find a better system than fast rack. Uh, honestly, it's one of those things like I think of surf prep and fast rack as like good, world class items, the best human beings on earth. You never have to think about it again. And And when I talk to like Sherwin or Benjamin Moore or Hirschfields or Fast Rack or Surf Prep. I, I feel like I'm giving them an insult, but really it's the best, it's the best compliment I can ever give them, which is I don't even think about it. I, I use your thing, it never fails, it always performs, and I just don't have to think about it. And we have so many other things to think about. I would much rather think about trainer Tina, all of our other craftsmen and apprentices, all of our clients, the human side of it, they keep worrying about primers and top coats and uh, and and sanders and racking system. It's like when you buy fast rack, that's it for life. You got a thing that's not gonna that's not gonna be used up sometime in your life. When you buy a surf prep, it's just like yes, it does well. It's awesome. It takes an entire step out of the SVT, the vac stack. We sand and we go right to tack rag because we hook it up to, uh, you know, a, a vacuum. So it's one of those things too, where if the people from Surf Prep and Michael Halverson from Fast Rack were horrible people, I would still buy their products, but it would not be a satisfying experience. That they are the best humans on earth just gives you that warm, fuzzy feeling. Like we're all doing good here. They care about you. It's a good thing. And that's all you can ask about. So uh, Crystal, I can say <laughs> Nick brought me, uh, was seeing all the social media posts. Uh, the work he does really made me think I want to work for that man because he can teach me a lot. Uh, don't be afraid to put your work out there. It'll attract people. Yeah. Crystal craftsman, Crystal, uh, uh, wonderful words. I do appreciate it. Let's go through IG here. Grit city. Are you willing to share your onboarding SOP? I had six painters. I'd like to get to 10 so far. My hires have been 
referred by current painters. That's awesome. Uh, Grit City from uh, from Instagram. Yes, uh, email me, nick at nickslavic.com, and I will send you that stuff. Uh, and again, remember, it feels like with the whole hiring, recruiting, onboarding, apprenticeship sort of thing, a spreadsheet is sort of helpful to focus. A training guide is helpful to focus. 90% of it is still what you do with them, how you give them goals, how you hold them accountable, and other stuff like that. So uh, Grit City, Nick at nickslavic.com, and I will, I will send you some resources. <laughs> Yeah, and, and Grit City, I will say this, um, nobody's perfect. Nobody's perfect with recruiting. Uh, <laughs> we, have two, we have two sort of um, things that we always, well, we have lots of things that we talk about in the company. I have this list of things we call baselines. Number one, PBC, people be crazy. You can, you can do all the normal things that you do. You can be a good person, you can have a good business, you can do good work. People will be crazy, no matter what you do. They're, people are subjective. People have feelings. Uh, people are changed by moon cycles and, and 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 other interactions with people you can't control. There's only so much we can control. And then there's this craziness outside that once in a while interacts with us. PBC, people be crazy. Another thing that you cannot factor for, you can try to control for, you cannot factor for fully is MPC, mass personal chaos. When you bring somebody into your company, they may interview perfectly. Their personality profile, their disc profile might be right on. Everything may point to good. They get in your company and something outside of your control or knowledge will completely render them dysfunctional and unfunctional in your business. MPC, mass personal chaos. Who knows? You can't control for that stuff. All you can do is set it up the best you can and be good to people and hope that they be good back to you. It's just one of those things. So, Ah, uh, let's see. No drip painting. Can you talk about your review, how you review your painters and keep them accountable? Yes. So number one is you have to have standards in your company in order to hold somebody accountable to. So we actually have a thing called the standards. Uh, if you'd like it, I can share it. It's uh, nick at nickslavic.com. Basically, you must meet our core values. And underneath our core values, then there's the thing like show up for work, produce at $55 an hour, uh, don't get callbacks on your work. Your uniform must be clean. Your job site must be clean. Your equipment must be maintained. Stuff like that. Simple deliverables. Each one of those things, you can either do this or this. If your standards in your company are make people happy, do good work, do fast work, those are all subjective. At any one day, you and your employee can argue that you've both done or not done those things. So you need things that are light switches. They're either on or they're off, and people need to clearly understand that. Four times a year, we sit down for something called a GSR, Goal Setting and Review, uh, where we actually take the standards of the company, starting with the core values and all those things I just mentioned, assign a numerical value one to 10. One being you have not done them, absolutely. 10 being you've actually gone above the standard. Eight to 10 for me is a yes. 10 is you've, you've gone above the standard. So magically, when you look at trainer Tina's GSRs, lots of 10s, lots of stuff over this end here, because she's an awesome person. Uh, but we hold people accountable to that. And when people know they're going to be held accountable to that, they change their sort of behaviors a little bit sometimes. I do too. When I know that somebody's going to be checking on something that I'm doing, my goals magically will just perform a little bit better. So you have to sit down and it's not just reviews because I don't like this whole review thing because when you talk about reviews, you think it's only going to be negative and then you always think, well, this is the only time that an employee is ever going to be able to ask for a raise. And even though some people treat it like that, that's not that to me. You must put in a goal setting process in there. So GSR, goal setting and review. The goal setting is the main thing. People are actually rated from three months ago on their goal. And the good thing is, I basically tell them, let's set a goal together. I'm going to give you a goal. You can give yourself your own goals. But three months from now, we're going to sit down and talk about how you did. Uh, but in that, I say, I will break myself to give you everything you need to hit that goal. I will personally train you. I will mentor you. I will do whatever I can in order to help you with that. And so it's a team. I don't want people to fail at this stuff. When somebody's in your company, you should not be looking for ways to get them out of your company. You should be looking for ways to have them win with you. That's a huge thing. All right, back to do, 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 back to Facebook. <laughs> James Gilbert, what happened to the Nick Slavic coffee mugs? I love mine. Uh, let's see. So we actually got some. This is old school stuff. Uh, we have, I don't know if you can see back. Ooh, let's see right there. There's one of my tan edition ones with the face on it. 
We have a couple of these. These are sort of collector items now. This is the first run. This is actually an experimental finish that my mug lady did on here. And this is a one of a kind sort of thing. So we have this and we have the face mugs. Now, this is why I don't readily distribute these all the time. I send them out once in a while. Uh, my mug lady's awesome. She does not mass produce them. Every one of those is made by hand. So I get basically one a week. So I have a standing 52 week 52 mug order all the time. And whenever she gets done with 25 or 50, I go pick them up. So I send them out as best I can. Uh, people have always told me to open up a shop where people can buy this stuff. I don't know. That feels a little weird to me. Uh, you know, selling stuff with my own face on it. Uh, that feels weird. That feels like crossing a certain line. Uh, so basically if people are patient and people are wait, I've never charged for anything and I've always sent stuff out, but sometimes we have stuff. Sometimes we don't. So uh, best paint for cabinets when using dark colors like black that won't chip and cure hard. Chemnitz, yes. Uh, a young craftsman, Nate, in my company, uh, insanely thoughtful, good craftsman, uh, just did an entire railing set in a house and we used black scuff -X. And surprise, surprise, it dried super fast, super hard, no blocking, no fingerprints, no weird stuff. Uh, so oil primer, and then we use the black scuff X and honestly, it performed exactly like white scuff X, which is, which is a good thing. So, uh, let's see, best pen, do, 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 do. Oh, questions are coming in. Let me get in here. Da, 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 da. Nick, can you per persuade surf pipe to get in the UK market? Yes. So this is, uh, spam the living heck out of them with direct messages. Canada, UK, people ask me all the time, can you get these here? Can you send them here? They will eventually when it makes economic sense. Uh, so they're a very smart family. They care deeply uh, for all of us. Uh, the people who work at that company are amazing people. They will find a way for you guys. So let them know how much you want it and magically they'll find a way to get them to you. So what's your opinion about smoking in your vehicles? No, absolutely not. We are a smoke-free work environment. You're not allowed to smoke on our job sites, in our vehicles, at our shop, stuff like that. Uh, Thomas Drake, stay humble. You as well. Uh, it's uh, actually, this is one of those things that uh, I get humbled quite a bit uh, doing this job every day. Humans humble me and uh, I get humbled quite a bit. So I hope, I hope, uh, I hope that comes off. Uh, Wendy watching and uh, listening. Wendy's actually an awesome client of ours. <laughs> uh, trainer Tina actually did her house. So in the background, your employees during the job at my house was refreshing to hear and see how professional and important your employees are. Yes, absolutely. I, listen, we win with people. Uh, there's nothing. So people always ask like, where's this all going? And I think at the end of all this, when I cannot run a business or cannot paint anymore, the thing that would make me the most happy is creating a place where people genuinely love their work Clients genuinely love our people who love their work. And we proceed like that. How big that company is, I don't know. Don't care. It'll happen. Water will find its level. It's way one. I would that would make me the most proud. Having a 75-person painting company that is impersonal, uh, that has lots of complaints, lots of callbacks, will generate lots of money for me, but it will not generate lots of happiness for me. I would like to try to do that and still maintain all the happiness. I don't know if it's possible. I don't know if you can do that and make it personal. Uh, but I want something where people genuinely are like, oh no, this is like loving your job is a thing. We spend more time in our jobs than with our families sometimes. And we need to remember that there is other ancillary benefits of running these companies than financial freedom. So uh, great job, Nick, industry leader. Thank you for your service to our country. Absolutely. Uh, I know you're a busy man. Appreciate all of the emails. Absolutely, man. Happy to do it. Uh, what's your go-to ceiling paint, trim paint? Well, oh, geez, you're asking for it all. Holy mama, Tim. Okay, really quickly, if you can get it, oil primer, scuff X for trimming cabinets, uh, Sherwin-Williams CHB uh, for ceilings. If you can't get that, it, that's Chicago High Build. Uh, if you can't get that, use Master Hide. I know a lot of people love that stuff too. Um, I'm trying to think, uh, Hirschfields makes MHB. Uh, that's another great one, but that's a regional company, kind of up Midwest sort of thing. Uh, let's see, wall paint, Sherwin Williams duration, Matt, uh, awesome paint. Just absolutely love the stuff. Uh, Cammy, fellow Minnesota painter. The mug is great. Absolutely. Uh, Brian Chemnitz, painting oak cabinets. We hang our cabinet doors and have the tan and bleed problems when spraying one coat of oil cover stain primer. What are we doing wrong? Okay. This is, this is the problem with this sort of thing. It sort of never happens to us. So I don't really know how to respond. The only thing I know is 
Well, I will say this. One out of every hundred kitchens has something wacky happen like this. You'll get something bleeding. A lot of time it's not tan and it's something else. We had a kitchen uh, this last week that had something bleed through and, and what I, it was just a weird area, like right under sort of like the countertops. And I believe that there was a deep fryer on the counter that deeply saturated the wood with uh, oil or grease or cooking stuff. And even after degreasing, even after SVTing, even after priming, something leached out of there, it's fine. Now, the solution for this is either upshot rattle can or cover stain rattle can. Uh, we prime with cover stain normally or uh, extreme block uh, primer uh, from Sherwin. If anything looks witchy that comes through, uh, we hit it with a rattle can of either Upshot, which is a shellac-based primer, uh, or Cover Stain, which is an oil equivalent. And uh, honestly, we never have problems after that. So I would do that. If if you are getting bleed through like that, uh, I would probably double prime, honestly, uh, to fill the pores. Uh, you might even want to work it in with a brush to fill the pores because sometimes with the oak wood, if you prime and there's still an open pour, that leaves an avenue for a stain to possibly get through. So I would uh, I would take a look at that. Uh, let's see. Oh, let's go back to IG. We got a whole bunch of good questions coming through here. And then I'll probably cut her short here. Oh, Dominic Crowley from Ireland. Man, I love that dude. He has a private uh, Instagram account, but look up Dominic Crowley. I mean, that is a dude who uh, shares my core values and is doing insanely good work. If I could touch some of the historic estates that he touches, I would be a happy man the rest of my life. Like we consider 90 to 100 year old old here. He's working on castle kind of stuff back there in Ireland. So super jealous, man. The painter guy, how's it going? Uh, Bresson. <laughs> uh, yes, man. Uh, Mr. Bresson is a young budding craftsman. Uh, who just became eligible to drink alcohol in the United States. He's that young and uh, he's doing masterful work that I look on and say, man, if I could have been doing that stuff at that age, uh, that would have been quite something else. So thanks a lot, man. Uh, painters for less. Good luck. We've been fighting this sinking ship. And I, I listen, sometimes, man, it does feel like that. So, uh, Paint school. Do all company vehicles come back to the shop every day? Does everybody have to take their company vehicles to work? Uh, yes and no. Uh, yes, all company vehicles go back to the shop. Uh, they don't have to. If our gear is on site, you can drive your personal vehicle there. I don't make you drive a, a company vehicle. If you want to drive a company vehicle, it's kind of there for you. So uh, we should push the giant paint companies need to start an apprentice schools around the country, around the areas. So the craftsmanship can be learned and done correctly all the time. So listen, painters for less. Yes. The need. So I sort of agree with that. This is the crux of everything that I think about right now, which is everybody, giant paint companies, PCA, everybody in this industry right now will all agree. There's not enough good people. So what is our knee jerk reaction? Make more painters. I would argue that most painting companies don't have a problem making painters. They have a problem finding good people and then bringing them into a professionalized company. So I will say if the giant paint companies started trade schools in every major metro area around here and pumped out as many good painters, at least semi-trained painters as we needed, they would be unleashed upon these unscrupulous unprofessional companies that don't have any standards, don't have job descriptions, don't have employee manuals, don't have deliverables, don't have goal setting and reviews, don't have a pay scale, any of that stuff. And those people would get a sour taste in their mouth and leave the industry as they have over the last 20 years. So I would say we need to go back a few steps, fix it ourselves. We need to get ready for the decent human beings of, of uh, people to come in. We need to be professionalized. We need to run profitable companies that have a proven product, that have happy clients, that can take on these people and we're ready. I don't think some of us are good enough business owners to, to take on employees. I don't think we should. I think we need many lessons learned ourselves before we bring employees. I will say this, when somebody says, when should you hire your first employee? And I'll say 15 steps back, have you ever job costed? Have you ever job costed one job and compared it to an industry benchmark? And if they say no, I say you have years ahead of you uh, of doing this before you do that. You need to get out there and run a financially viable company. You need to solve the things that a business owner needs to solve before you unleash it on other people because you won't be ready. If you, you, if you, it's hard enough to find, recruit, train, and retain people. That is a full-time job for me right now. 
if I wondered about what paint to use where, if I wondered about basic pricing, if I wondered about the estimating process, uh, you know, the, the procurement process of materials and all that stuff, I, it would be too much stress and I wouldn't have enough time to run the company. Those things need to be solved or semi-solved before you bring people on. You, you should be bringing people into a well-oiled machine that is ready for them and, and is going to give you relief. Uh, Grit City Painters, possibly over sanding, talking about the bleeding on those cabinets. Yeah, that's always a possibility as well, too. Uh, Norton Custom Finishes, love your stuff. I like to prime first with gray and then white on top when I'm worried about bleed through. Ooh, that's another good one, too. Sort of using pigment, the chunks of pigment to block that stuff. That's kind of a cool trick. Uh, we need to be better painting companies. Uh, the paint professor. Uh, then better people will show up. If we build it, they will come. Dude, <laughs> you're speaking my language now. So, uh Let's see here. What else we got? Uh, we'll go through a couple more here. Uh, but da, 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 da. Let's see. Brian Chemnitz, do you have a production rates on all your SOPs? 38 seconds to fold a drop cloth. Uh, so not all the time because we're a training company. Um, what I do have on my bedroom SOP for any of you people who have it, I have times listed along the side that actually say this much time should be set for this if you want to do a four-hour bedroom, give or take. Uh, Oh, Gabby, Young Craftsman Gabby. Uh, it happened to all of our doors on that kitchen too. Cover stain, top coat one, and then the tannins bled through. And then we used Upshot, scuffed it smooth one more time and a second coat. And it was a chef's kiss. Yes, Gabby. Uh, Gabby works for me. She's awesome. She just passed her one year mark. She got poloed. She got booted. Uh, it, Red Wing Boots, uh, and uh, yeah, so Gabby's Kitchen, that's the kitchen I was talking about. Even after a top coat, we had some bleed through. They nailed it in the shop. Shop manager stayed late, got the doors done. We got them back in the next day, and because that scuff X dries so fast, we were able to hang them the next day, which is awesome. So Thomas Drake, uh, the truth, I absolutely believe. Angie, we need school to become a professionalized company. I would like to know more about that. I don't believe that's true. Uh, Nick, you nailed it. The core problem of our industry. Yes. Uh, you will not get any arguments cause that's what I believe deeply. Uh, Jay Osborne, just going into business for myself. I'll be 50 next week. Painting is easy though. Business end of it is my weakness. So the good thing, Jay, is that you probably have the depth of knowledge to, to know that your coding systems are probably solved. Uh, now I would say Jay, the the sort of thing that will open up the rest of the world to you and bring this weird, scary thing of business into focus is job costing. It's basically taking every job that you do and tracking material and hours used on it. Even if you don't know what to do with that right now, that is the most valuable thing. That's the entry level data to get you to wherever else you need to go. And uh, Jay, if you need any help with that, nick at nickslavic.com, email me. I can send you a template. I can even walk you through it. So. Ah, Brian Chemnitz, if, so if you have no production rates, how do you do an accurate bid? Remember, um, I'm going to share something with you guys. <laughs> this is how I think about estimating. There is, I kind of think of it as a triangle. There's gut and experience. I just know what to charge for stuff. It's been 30 years. I can basically do one of these and tell you this is what it should be, but it's based on my experience, production rates, and the market. There is also production rates which is things that you've tracked. Now, there's certain things that we, you know, for drywall, we do have production rates that we estimate for. But when we, when we go, <laughs> simplify, Brian, when we go into a bedroom, a standard size bedroom, we do not need to measure it. That is a price. We have done so many of them, thousands of bedrooms. I don't know why I would need to take out a digital measurer. And so what if it's six inches more on this side and you got to charge another $1.70 for this bedroom? To me, again, I would rather have 100% compliance with a 90% perfect system than 50% compliance with a 100% perfect system like that. I don't let perfect stand in the way of insanely good and effective. So uh, in, in the thinking of it, uh, I know some guys that take three or four hours to create an estimate for, for a home. Uh, estimator Andy and I can do eight, nine, 10 estimates a day, and it's basically a numbers game. We'll get it 99% close. We're not going to spend an extra two or three hours to get it that 1%, but what we can do is fit in another two or three estimates a day, which is better for our clients and better for our company. So uh, when we want to close, uh, you know, we have the ability of probably doing per a two people estimating team, we probably have the ability to do about 40% more estimates than most people based on this sort of system. 
So this is kind of how I think about it. You can do production rates. I know guys that will measure every square foot of every wall, every linear inch of trim, every, every single thing you can do, and then have modifiers for popcorn versus swirl texture versus texture on the walls, no texture, dark color. And at some point, you have to say, if you charge 400 bucks for a bedroom, can you make money at it? And if the answer is yes all the time, then maybe just go forth and do that with experience like that. So uh, Brian, that's kind of my thinking about that stuff. Production rates are just one thing that you can use to inform. The My biggest argument against production rates is exteriors <laughs> because I showed everybody, I use my own house, the Slavic house, as an example of how I broke down the production rates. I could go to six other jobs, all of my neighbors around here and apply those production rates and have a wildly inaccurate estimate because there's landscaping, there's different types of siding, there's different colors, there are different trims, soft, it's facious, this. So again, it's not the end all and be all. Because you found out that you can charge $1.85 a square foot for exterior siding, if you apply that, um, if you apply that with blinders onto all your projects, you are gonna overcharge and not get some jobs and you're gonna way undercharge and lose your tail on them. So you still need to modify it with other things, experience, the market, you know, uh, other things like that, so. Oh, here we go. Oh, somebody somebody led with tough question. Tough question here. My wife wants to know what's the best thing your wife ever did to support your business. Yes, <clears throat> she put uh, restraints on what I do. Um, I was raised in a family business where you will work Monday through Friday, you will work Saturday, and if something needs to be done, you will work Sunday which always happened. Uh, you will work sun up to sundown. You will martyr yourself. You will never do anything intelligently. You will just get out there and break yourself. You will work Thanksgiving. You will work Easter. You will work Christmas. You will wor work the 4th of July because that's a badge of honor. We're so busy. We got to work holidays. That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Um, originally, uh, she did this very kindly, but she basically said, you know, first, you're not working weekends anymore. And I was like, oh my God, we're going to lose all this production, all this money and things like that. First best thing I ever did. And then evenings. Uh, once in a while, uh, when the company needs me, I still do evening stuff. I've been doing a couple uh, estimates each evening these weeks because I want to make sure our people have enough work. Um, but other than that, no evenings. And now what's really interesting is that I kind of don't work Fridays. Um, our whole company runs on a four-day work week. And we go crazy Monday through Thursday. Our painters work seven to five. Our production teams are up at five or six. Uh, me and estimator Andy are out all hours of the day and night making sure everything gets done. And then when Friday comes, uh, the two production managers basically use that time uh, to sort of recoup from the week, plan for the next week, get the thing that they need to do to get ready for our Monday meetings. When there's no painters going that don't need them, which is helpful, Andy goes out there and does estimates and then gets ready for his things that I hold him accountable. Uh, same with the production team. They job cost all the projects. Andy gets a sales tracker done with the amount he sold and all that other stuff. Uh, and then for me, Friday is, it's like a free day for me. And what I choose to do with my free day is in the morning, uh, I still do you know the fitness thing in the morning, but then I work on business things that I wanna work on. Uh, which are visionary sort of things. Like uh, I, I work on a lot of financial stuff for the company. I, I run different models in the company to see you know, what jobs are profitable, where we need training. I vision out a few years. I think about my goals for the quarter for myself and I work on those. So technically I work Friday mornings. I should say this, Friday after the Ask a Painter show normally, I'm just off and that's family time. But Friday mornings are for me, free play time as a business owner. I wanna do fun visioning things. I wanna create spreadsheets and make some graphs and vision into the future. And what if we do this? What if we do this? And that's the fun stuff for me. And uh, that's what I find myself doing. Um, yeah, so basically, yeah, the, the constraints are stop working all those hours. And, and it's not like you need to give up something, it's that you need to be better. You need to do in 40 hours what you have been doing in 80. You need to be smarter, you need to be more efficient, and you need to actually put some brain power towards your job instead of just ah, gritting it through. So that's kind of how I think there. Okay, let's see here, a couple more here. God, these questions are so good. I don't wanna, uh, I eventually gotta get back to <laughs> ice fishing or something today, so. Uh, Let's see, John Milkovich, how do you uh, how do you stand out above the competition when the customers are spoiled for choice? Honestly, this is something that frustrates me. Uh, there is no benefit to me uh, being Ask a Painter, being Nick Slavic, being part of the PCA, really, uh, as far as a public thought leader to any of my clients. Um, 
almost all my employees do not know who I was before they got to the company. Most of them, um, most of my clients have never heard of me before. I'm just a painting company. So uh, there's really not a way to do that. There's tons of people who are half my price. There's lots of people who are more expensive than me. And honestly, when people think about this, um, words of wisdom um, from somebody else, perspective that helps snap a lot of thing into focus. How do you stand out above? That's only about 30% of your people that might be able to be swayed. Somebody who does this way better than me says 30% of the people will never hire you no matter what. They're going to ask you for an estimate and it was never going to work. You can show them sample doors. You can try to tell them about your paints. They don't care. They were never going to take you. A third of the people will basically take you as long as you don't vomit on their shoes. They're going to do this unless you ruin it for them. A third of the people can actually be swayed. Those are those people basically. Uh, and honestly, I don't know how to do that. If, if I think the people being swayed, number one is price. Number two is timeline. And if you can master those things and hit those two buttons, it doesn't matter what paint you use. It doesn't matter your uniform. It doesn't matter all these things you do for them. So what we try to do, uh, is provide things above and beyond the paint because we all buy the same paint. We generally apply it in the same way. Obviously, I think we do it a little better, but the clients don't know that. And honestly, they don't care. So what we do is we stress the things that stress the client, which are we help with color, we move furniture, and we clean up after ourselves. And those three things are the main things they ask about. Number one, they always worry about color and they should. It's a big question. Number two, the furniture. There's a lot of people who don't want to move all this furniture. And number three, the cleanup. They've had people in their house make a mess and we don't do that. So we're adding some things in there that set us apart. Honestly, I don't know if it's a benefit really. I mean, if we came in at half the prices, we would sell more jobs. Uh, just like employees. I found out that uh, when you, well, not, not my employees, but when we hire people who said they've had painting experience, they express the need for, they want to be part of a team. They want a future. They want to feel warm. They want family environment. But if somebody else gives them two more dollars an hour, they'll forget all about that stuff and go elsewhere. I sometimes get that feeling from the clients, which is, yes, there are people like Wendy Anderson who truly will only hire people that she trusts. There are a lot of people though, that if you can do it a day sooner or for a hundred dollars less, they will take you. And that's fine. There's a lot of good people out there doing a lot of good work. I don't hold it against them. It's just an economic reality. So <sighs> Joey, does anybody have any success doing door hangers? What's your call rate? Yes. Um, a large portion of my business is run with that uh, in the winter. You can, so with 15 or 20 employees, give or take, we need to force marketing. Um, word of mouth will get you about 30 to 50% of your jobs. The rest of it you need to pay for. And honestly, I've tried all the Google, the Facebook, the Instagram, you can get responses, but the people aren't as serious. So we go to uh, door hangers and direct mail and uh, yes, very low response rate, but it is valuable. And if you think I don't care about response rate, I care about a marketing budget. Uh, a marketing budget for a million dollar company should probably be about $35,000, give or take. So that's a large weapon to wield as far as uh, direct mailing goes. And if you know that going in, you don't feel bad about it. A lot of people feel bad about every dollar they spend on marketing like, oh, this is a, no, it's a cost of doing business. If you break it down, I think um, when we finish, when I did my marketing analysis for the last year, I think every completed job that we did cost me between 75 and a hundred bucks to get, give or take. Sounds like a lot of money, but some of the jobs were $30,000 jobs. Some of them were a single bedroom, give or take. If you need that work, there's only a couple ways to get it. You got to pay for it. And Joey, uh, I'd be happy to talk about that too. So Jay Osborne, love the four day work week. Me too. Uh, let's see. DeMichael Fontaine, can you tell my, <laughs> well, you have to wait for paint to dry. Hey man, listen, that's something that he's going to have to experience himself. <laughs> I'd be happy to talk to him offline, but I doubt an email will fix that. Sounds like you need to put your arm around him and uh, explain some stuff. So, all right, last two here. After the training I attended, when you visited uh, Corey's, I changed my schedule down for downtime on Friday. So my crew still works, but it's planning. Uh, and now, so now my crew still works, but it's planning. And now we have a Friday breakfast morning meeting where we do planning, cleaning the shop and small odds and ends. Uh, we found ourselves working with more ease. Thank you for the advice. Listen, it's a, it's a great thing. And I had a great, uh, great time with you guys there. And uh, honestly, you need to force yourself to sometimes do this. Uh, I, I heard a great podcast with, uh, with, obviously I'm biased. I love Jason Paris. He was on with somebody else talking about traction and they were talking about this sort of thing where taking 
somewhere between 15 minutes and an hour at the start of the week to sit down and meditate about what needs to be done, plan it out, put some time into your week is insanely good. We feel like we need to just, well, I can't be there for a meeting because I'm out in the field getting stuff done, or I can't take the time to do that because I have other stuff going on. You're trading dollars for pennies when you do that sort of thing. Sometimes you need to build that in to make your to make yourself better during the productive time. Taking that time to plan is, is very special, but there is a downside to that. I know some guys who try to run their paint businesses from their computers doing spreadsheets, and they never want to get out there and produce. They never want to get out there and hold people accountable. You can over plan as well. So I will say a good mix is you know maybe 10 to 20% of your time as a business owner and not a painter uh, spent towards visioning and planning is probably good. The rest of the time, holding people accountable is an absolute way to win. Uh, Brian, man, I love what you're doing. This is really making me think about the question and everything. By the way, we cock our cabinet door panels in Oregon. Oh, how, oh, oh sorry. No, that's fine. I know people who do it. It's fine. Uh, we don't do it only because we have crazy seasonal movement. Um, you know, like uh, one of my clients pointed out that um, yesterday or the day before, it was about 60 degrees different from a year previous on the same day during the year. So that's what we have to deal with here. Uh, Michael Holston, thanks much. Ah, absolutely guys. Okay, all right, last question. Take care of yourself from Instagram. Oh, painters for less. There is no competition. There's too much money out there. Plus, you know how good you are. Yes, another wise thing that I stole from somebody else was our only competition is our ability to execute our business plans, which in the residential repaint market at this time in the economy, I believe is true. So, all right, everybody, I have gone way over an hour. You guys are the best. I appreciate this. I'm liking these Saturday morning things. If you want me to continue, let me know. Otherwise, guys, I'm here for you. You guys have always been there for me. I do appreciate it. Uh, again, we always talk about the PCA and standards. Looky, looky, folks. This is your cost and estimating guide. Looky that, job costing in here. That's how important it is. This is a codified manual for the industry leading 150 year old trades organization uh, that I'm a part of. Uh, it's all there, folks. The standards are free. Those things cost money. But if you want people who enjoy the free standards and enjoy the cost and estimating and the thought experiments, PCA, Painting Contractors Association, thank you. When you guys are joining, when you're interacting with the PCA, you have been messaging me, you've been messaging them. We, as an organization, uh, as a member, as a big fan of theirs, and also as a, as a member of their board of directors, I love hearing that feedback because we're trying to gather up the finest thought leaders in this industry in order to change this industry. Like I said before, we need people, but first we need to be professionals. And that's what we're going to do. That's what this organization is all about. That's what the people who are here have done for me over the years. I've had people look me in the face and say, so how's business, Nick? And I say, oh man, we're absolutely killing it. This is like five years ago. You wouldn't believe it. We're doing probably double what everybody else is doing. And they're like, oh yeah? Come here, sit down, grab a pen, piece of paper, and show me. Show me how you're killing it. Show me how you're doubling this. And I had nothing to write down because it's all feelings-based. And most of us run feelings-based businesses. If you guys, if you guys want to run a data plus feelings business, the PCA is the place to do it. So have a good weekend, folks. Um, all the things that you've ever wanted to solve, all the questions you've ever had are solved either by the things the PCA has or by the people within the PCA. I would urge you to look them up. Link is going to be in this show later on. Thank you all. Have a great week. Have a great weekend. And we will talk to you guys later.